G'day everyone and welcome to episode number 13 of the Australian Rock Show. My name is Dennis Gray from the Rockin' and Rollin' Gray Brothers. Today is Friday the 3rd of April 2015 when this show is being recorded. As the original frontman for ACDC, Dave Evans' place in rock and roll history is assured. But let me tell you folks, Dave's time with Malcolm and Angus Young is only one chapter in a lifetime spent producing great, hard-driving rock and roll. One week back on the 27th of March, we got a hold of Dave, who had just landed back in Sydney, and dug deep into his rock and roll past. An interview which we will hear in a moment. But let's kick off with a tune. A song which resonates with many of us. Here is Dave Evans with Sold My Soul to Rock and Roll. Dave, uh, my name is Dennis Gray. Welcome to the Australian Rock Show. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, hi Dennis. Good to speak with you too. So mate, we started today's show with a track from your second solo album, Sinner, titled Sold My Soul to Rock and Roll. Mate, if ever a song tells the story of someone's life, that song has your name all over it, doesn't it? (laughs) Well, I wrote it, so I guess so. Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, also pleased that, uh, that particular song was nominated as best rock song at the, uh, Los Angeles Music Awards in 2007. So it, uh, I still do it. I still, I'll still do that live now. So, yeah. It's, I read that. It's fantastic. And, uh, may I say that in 2015, it is so great to have guys like you still out there producing, uh, kick-ass rock and roll. And although Sinner is some time ago now, from what I've read, the response to that album was really, really positive. That must must have been satisfying. Oh, yeah, it was. It was really, I suppose, my first really proper uh, solo uh, album, I guess. And um, I wrote it mostly with uh, Mark Tinson, uh, my old rabbit mate from Newcastle. He was in Rabbit yep. with me. And uh, yep. he, he also produced the album as well. So uh, Mark's been producing for a long time and winning awards himself for his production. Mm. Um, so that was really, really pleasing. And, uh, uh, of course I've had quite a few different, uh, albums and EPs out since, but yeah, that was, was really pleasing. The, the, uh, uh, the critics loved it. Fans loved it. And, uh, also to get nominated for that award in Los Angeles with, uh, some of the rock and roll, uh, mm. was more than pleasing, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. And you're currently back in Australia. Are you on vacation? Are you you going to do going to do some shows or? No, uh... I only got back a couple of days ago from uh, yep. from Texas and um, just chilling out. And um, I think I've got one or two shows while I'm here before I uh, head off again. But uh, just good to be back in Australia as always, um, doing everything Australian, um, yeah. enjoying everything Australian, and uh, <laughs> um, that's great. What's uh, what's life like in Texas for you? Um... Any similarities to Australia? I've, I've travelled through there a couple of times. Um, it's so different, really. Um, they, they are very, very different, the, the Americans anyway, and, uh, mm. and Texans uh, in particular. Um, you just, you've got to, you know, like any country, you know, when you go there, you don't know a person until you live with them, and you don't know a country until you actually sure. live in the country. And, um, yeah, they're, they're Texans, all right, and uh, they've accepted me you know, really, really well, and and uh, that's what they call me, the king of all badasses. So, yeah. <laughs> um, they should know they've had their share of badasses, yeah. as, you, as you know, mate. Agreed, um, agreed. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm Aussie through and through when I'm in Texas, and uh, they love that. And um, uh, as I say, you think I'm, 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 I'm bad, I'm mad. I said, yeah, 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 yeah mate, mate's from Australia. <laughs> will you, um, Dave, will you settle there for good, or will you one day come home? Uh, I'm there on my time's off. I'm also in Australia my time's off too. I mean, I've been to Texas mostly, I suppose, over the last 10 years, but uh, it depends on where I am in the world. If I'm sort of mm. close by Australia or whatever, I'll come come home here. Um, but, uh, but Texas is also my home as well. I've been there for that long, you know what I mean? Nice, but, uh, yeah. It depends. Uh, I sort of, if I get time off, it's, you know, Texas or Australia, uh, one or the other. I'm here just for a break now. And it's just really great. Uh, before I head probably probably back to the United States and then uh, back to Ukraine again to tour there. So I'm going to uh, going to mention that later on in the interview. But yeah. before we uh, we get into the interview, I want to share with you quickly how I discovered you and your music. And it was actually in the late 70s. 
via a cassette copy of Rabbit's first album, which my brother owned. And back in the day, mate, he and I would play that thing to death. And as far as I'm as far as I'm concerned, Rabbit's version of the Johnny Preston hit from 1960, Running Bear, is the definitive and only version of that song. Yeah. Now it's funny because when I first joined the band after ACDC split, uh, I split from mm. them. Um, they were doing that song. They were a Newcastle band, top Newcastle band. They used to play the country yep. areas around there in Newcastle. And that was one of their standards. And I said, I never in my life will I ever do Running Bear. Never. Yeah. I, I don't care. You know? <laughs> and yeah. um, anyway, we were, I'd learnt the thing, but I, I said, I'm never going to do this song. Anyway, we're in a, a country town. And for some reason, we just weren't killing it. So, you know, like we always smashed it. Rabbit was such mm. a great band live too, you know. A great stage act and everything, and for some reason we did. We were doing four sets, two sets into it, and they just weren't. We didn't have them, you know. And sure. uh, Mark Tinson actually came up to me and said, "You got to do Running Bear." Yeah. <laughs> and I sort of went, "Oh my God!" And I thought, oh, "Well, I'm way out in the bush. No one's going to see me." I thought, "Ah, oh, all right, I'll do it." <laughs> and we did it, and the place went nuts. <laughs> I mean, absolutely nuts. And uh, I've never seen anything like it, you know. And uh, <laughs> And of course, we killed it for the rest of the night. And um, so I, I did it again in a couple of, you know, the next two, and it killed it again. And mm. in, in the end, we did Checkers in in uh, in Sydney, the night spot. Yep. Checkers, the grooviest place going. And we, yep. did, we did Running Bear in Checkers nightclub, and the place went crazy. It was like New Year's Eve, though, in Conga Lines. I went mental, you yeah, know. I love it. So, love uh, it. so I said, bugger it. We, we're doing our first album, and uh, we're putting Running Bear on, on the album, and uh, I'm so glad we did. <laughs> Agreed. And I believe that Sony bought out CBS some time back. So what happened to the master tapes for those two Rabbit albums? That's uh, It's high time they were released on CD or put on iTunes, yeah, do you think? Yeah, no, I, th- I think CBS had got them, I think. Uh, Mark Tinson has spoken to a couple of labels who, who want the albums, and uh, mm. they've got to get it through Sony, and uh, um, I, I suppose i better check with Mark Tinson to see where that is, because there are a lot of fans are asking for it on CD. Sure. Um, I, I'd love to see the, the albums, the classic Aussie rock uh, from the 70s, and uh, um, it, it's would, just, it would be great. To it's a shame. Out. It's a shame to just have them in, in the vaults there, but uh, I will focus on Rabbit a little later. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave, I do want to look into your time growing up in North Queensland, particularly how you got into rock and roll. I believe that after emigrating from Wales, you grew up as a teenager in the in the sixties in the town of Charters Towers. Yeah. What was that like for you? Uh, wow. Well, first of all, we emigrated to Townsville, actually, on the coast, and uh, right, it's a beautiful place, and it reminded me of South Wales. Anyway, because you got to hmm. remember, the east coast of Australia was named New South Absolutely. Wales. Yep, by by Captain yep. Cook. I did all, my history. <laughs> all, yeah, all the beautiful beaches and stuff like that, which is in South Wales. So, well, when I was in Townsville. Uh, we were on the uh, on Castle Hill, uh, actually. That's that's where we we first were, uh, Castle Hill, because Wales is full of castles. And uh, mm. overlooking the bay, it reminded me of Carmarthen Bay, where I used to go as a kid in Wales. So it was like Wales, except warm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, so nice. I liked it. Yeah, we were there for about six months before the family then moved west over the Great Dividing Range into the rain shadow into uh, Charters Towers, which was like nothing I'd ever seen uh, mm. on the planet. It was brown and dry and all the creeks were sand and, and that kind of thing. And uh, it was quite a culture shock for me. And um, and these Australians who were very foreign to me too, you know, the way that they were and that kind of thing. And I went to school in Charters Towers and, uh, and just uh, grew up really as, as I suppose, uh, you know the country style, Australian country style. Mm. But with the with the music thing, Dave, um, were your family musical? You, I've read that your father loved opera music. Were there siblings or friends into rock? Um, well, my father was a singer himself. Fabulous, oh, really? I didn't fabulous, know that. Fabulous tenor, because uh, mm-hmm. everybody sings in Wales, as we know. All my family sang. All my co- cousins and my aunties are beautiful singers. Uh, really was a beautiful thing. He used to sing at the, the uh, town concerts and that kind of stuff. And we didn't get television until I was about fifteen. We just had radio and and uh, and music, and we that, that's what we had at home. So I sort of grew up with my dad's music, including opera, because he was right into mm. opera as well. So it's quite diverse music till I sort of discovered uh, the Beatles, I guess, when I was about eleven or twelve, and um, and that changed everything for me and the rest of the world, if you know what I mean. So. And uh, sure. my first band ever was in Charters Towers uh, as a 17-year-old. So. 
I was going to ask you that. We're going we're to get on that. But what about other local Australian acts? Um, you know, you're into the Beatles. What about Loved Ones, Masters, Apprentices, Easy Boots, Missing Links? Oh, I loved all of them. They, they loved were, all they, that? They were fabulous bands. I mean, they were as good mm. as anything, apart from the Beatles, really. Uh, they, were, sure. they were as good as anything from, from uh, the UK at the time. Uh, and uh, all of those bands. I mean, I, I had all their records, you know, as well. Mm. Uh, Easy Beats were fantastic, of course, and Loved Ones and bands like The Throb and uh, Normie Rowe, for instance. Uh, mm. Normie was fantastic, you know. we uh, A lot of great bands. Australia had amazing bands in the 60s, you know. So, um, uh, And, of course, we loved all the music from, from England at the same time. So they were mm. all uh, my, uh, my favourite bands at the time, yeah. So uh, I, I'm just trying to work your timeline. So around 1970, uh, while still living in Charters Towers, you mentioned you form a small outfit. Were they called In Session? And yeah. what, what style of music was that? Yeah, it was a little bit before that, uh, in the 68 or something like that, 59. Um, okay. And, um, yeah, I was asked to join a band, a local boys, because uh, I had to sing all the time. Anyway, I sang to sing in the local cafes and put the jukebox on, and, of course, you could hear me and my sister uh, louder yeah. than the jukebox and all that sort of stuff. And I was always a top singer through school as well. I was in the estate, so everybody knew me as a singer, uh, but not professional, you know. And um, anyway, these boys uh, asked me uh, if I'd join their band, that little band together, and uh, hmm. which was really cool. And I said, yeah, sure. And uh, we uh, we uh, did a rehearsal, and uh, we started, uh, I was only, what, 17, 18, and because mm. we were playing the pubs, you couldn't get in there. You couldn't drink unless you were 21 in those days. Sure. Um, but, you know, we were able to, to get in there and play underage because we were in, a, in the band, you know what I mean? So, okay. And, yeah. and it was really cool. It was, we were doing Top 40, and they had the other band in town uh, called the Trisonics. They used to do mostly country. Uh, a bit of rock and roll, but a lot of the country stuff that the, the people liked up there because we lived in the country, Charter Town. Mm. Uh, but we were the groovy sort of band with the long hair, <laughs> and that was the, the older style with this elder style haircut. So around this time period, you, you decide to move to the bright lights of Sydney. I, 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 I imagine that must have been a massive change for you. Did you settle in King's Cross? And uh, I guess that made you pretty streetwise, right? Yeah, I went to the big smoke, as we used to call it, <laughs> mm. uh, there, because uh, a lot of people you know, would say, oh, Dave, you're really great, and blah, blah. And, uh, um, so I decided to... Uh, to try my hand uh, in the big time, if you know what I mean. And I asked the other boys, come on, let's go. And everybody says, we're great, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the other guys, they had jobs there that they wanted to keep and girlfriends, I suppose, or whatever. And mm. and uh, they weren't as ambitious as I was, and uh, they decided to stay in Charters Tower. So I ended up going down there to Sydney. You went alone, okay. Myself, and it ended up in King's Cross, as you know, one of the toughest parts of the world. Sure. Uh, apart from Australia, uh, believe me. And... Uh, um, yeah, certainly got streetwise uh, in a hurry, uh, living in King's Good. Cross, that's for sure. Late 72, Dave, you joined Newcastle slash Sydney outfit Velvet Underground, replacing Andy Imlar. And they had changed their name to Pony, which featured a couple of uh, guys, Les and Herm, who would later go into TMG. Malcolm Young had left Velvet Underground by the time you joined. My question for you is, was uh, Velvet Underground slash Pony, were they the first band you joined since arriving in Sydney? Uh, no, I've I'd, I'd been with uh, another band called Django, D-J-A-N-G-O, hmm. after Django Reinhardt, the, the famous uh, guitarist, uh, and played around in in that band, Django, uh, in Sydney, uh, before auditioning for Velvet Underground. And they were called Velvet Underground again by that stage, I think for a short, really? period, okay. short period of time they called themselves Pony, uh, but by the time uh, I auditioned for them, um, they were called Velvet Underground again, so... Mm. Uh, I joined uh, those boys, and uh, the, they were very, very professional, and they used to talk about the former guitarist that used to be with the band, uh, mm. Malcolm Young. I hadn't met him, uh, but they used to talk about him at times. And, um, yeah, we we did uh, top shows uh, in Sydney and, and the surrounding areas. Mm. So um, some years later, obviously, your outfit Rabbit Tour with uh, Ted Maury Gang. Have you kept in touch with Les or Herm? From, uh, from those guys? Uh, for a little bit, I, I did. I think I did a commercial one time for uh, uh, him. He had his, a studio. Uh, Ramrod, yep. Yeah, the north side there. And uh, uh, 
uh, Mark Clinton rang me and said, hey, do you want to do a commercial for Herm? And uh, I went over there and did one. That's going back quite a few years now. Um, I haven't seen uh, Herm since then or, or less since the TMG days, really. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. you know, we, we were very good friends, of course, as you know, and, uh, and we toured together, as you said. Uh, mm. a three months to a what uh, right around Australia together it was a fantastic time with Ted Mulry and and the boys and of course all the guys from Rabbit they knew the boys from TMG as well because they're from Maitland and Newcastle sure and sure and it was Ted Mulry who actually got me to Rabbit so mm. I didn't know that yeah huh. I was this is after ACDC I was at Checkers one night Checkers nightclub and uh, not long after that and uh, Ted said oh you're looking for a band and I said oh yeah. He said, there was a band from Newcastle called Rabbit looking for a singer. This singer uh, was leaving. And I'd seen them in Czechos. They were a wild, wild band. They were good, really good band. Uh, mm. Not many bands really impressed me much back in those days, really, uh, for what I was looking for, you know what I mean? And But they did. And so uh, Ted got me in touch uh, with the boys uh, up there. And uh, the guys came down to see me in Sydney. And uh, we had a chat and ended up joining Rabbit. So... So, wow, you know, Ted, I didn't know that. Yeah, so Ted and, and Herman and Les and all those boys are pretty instrumental in my career. Mm. Yeah. Nice. So not long after um, that band dissolves, you get a knock on your front door, as is uh, well known from um, Malcolm's younger brother, Angus, whose band Kentucky were looking for a singer, a, a, a gig which you declined. How prolific were Kentucky? Had you seen or heard them live? No, I'd never heard of them. And, uh, huh. um, but yeah, Angus, come on, we because uh, he heard that, you know, uh, the underground split up and, they, and the two boys had joined Ted, called Ted Murray came out. And, um, you know, he's nice enough for him to come around and see me and he sort of played the music that they were doing, which was pretty heavy, sort of, really heavy sort of guitar riff stuff and, and mm. pretty guitar orientated, you know. Well, I suppose because Angus was a guitarist and it was his band. Um, it didn't really interest me. Um, I was sort of more into vocals, you know, vocal, mm. vocals. And uh, um, so I declined that. At the time, yeah. So, uh, Dave, sometime later, and I assume this is in 1973, you answer a vocalist wanted at in the Sydney Morning Herald, which Malcolm had placed. As yet, you had not met him, but he invites you to jam with his band in Newtown, who at that stage have Colin Burgess on drums and Larry Van Crete in the lineup. Dave, as someone who grew up uh, in the 60s um, with the Masters Apprentices as heroes, it must have been incredible uh, for yourself to meet someone like Colin Burgess. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure was. Also, I guess the Easy Beats we mentioned before, uh, and I'm assuming um, George and Harry, were they at that first jam session? No, no, they weren't. Um, okay. I answered the ad and Malcolm was there and he knew of me and, of course, I knew of him because of the Velvet Underground connection. And he said that he was jamming with two guys, uh, Colin Burgess, from drummer from the Master of the Apprentices, wow, and, and another guy, Larry Van Creek, and they were looking for a singer uh, to uh, complete the lineup, you know, and we said, mm, you know, mm. get over here to to, New, uh, to Newtown uh, that afternoon, and uh, so I was very excited, especially with, you know Colin Burgess and Martha. I could buy their records when I was in school, you know, mm. and um, so I went around there to uh, Newtown and um, met them. You know, it was very exciting, and we just jammed the stuff that we all knew, a lot of stuff we did in Velvet Underground, a lot of Rolling Stones and some Chuck Berry rock and roll and some Free, you know, and that sort of stuff, and. Uh, um, everybody was happy, and uh, we all shook hands, and we we formed a band at that time. Mm, that's right. It's important to recognise that it's it's at that stage a band. But yeah. so a, a short time later, Malcolm tells the band uh, that his kid brother Angus will come to audition, one which he obviously passes. So you were there at that audition. I, yeah. I guess he would have been pretty nervous. Um, well, no, he, he asked the band if if uh, Angus could audition. He didn't say he's right. to audition. He said, okay. asked us if he could audition, and we all said, yeah, sure. And uh, mm. no, no problem at all. You know, like there was no animosity between me and Angus. I declined. It was just like that. Well, okay, bad luck. That's the way it goes. So no, okay. I, no problem at all. Angus you know, came over, and you know, we shook hands. They go, here you go. You know? And um, uh, because this was what w- music we were doing, you know what I mean? Mm. He was auditioning for us. <laughs> and so, you know, we jammed the same stuff, which Angus knew all those songs anyway. Are all popular songs, um, so we just jammed through. It's a formality, really. And uh, Malcolm said, "Is it okay if, if uh, Angus joins?" And we all went, "Yep, no problems at all." And uh, so we all shook hands, and uh, the band then had another member. Five of us now instead of four. 
So, Dave, this uh, 12 month or, or so period, 73, 74, was, was a busy but turbulent year yeah. for yourself. One, we, one which, although you didn't know it, would shape the rest of your life. And I guess, what are your memories of early 74 being bunkered down at EMI Studios recording with the band? Oh, that was an experience. I've never been, even been inside a recording studio. Before. First time, right? In First my time. Whole life, you know? Mm. And uh, I was just so excited. I got the 380 bus from Bondi. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, down into the city because that's where my studios were at the time. And uh, mm-hmm. I was just so excited. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I also knew I'd be, I'd be uh, uh, there with, uh, you know, uh, with Harry Vander and you know, George Young. I'd met George once before, but I hadn't met Harry Vander. And, um, you know, getting the lift up there. Uh, when I got to the building, I was just so nervous and excited at the same time. And, and of course, uh, they met me there, and I went into the studio, and it just looked like Star Trek to me. This great big desk, you know, and uh, what, a, the big, what an experience! The, yeah, the big glass window in front of the desk, and inside, of course, were, was the studio. So it was like Star Trek, and and um, to see meet Harry Vander, of course, was a thrill. And um, I just didn't say much; I just shut up and just watched. <laughs> really, mm. it's a good way to learn, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it's incredible, yeah. So as is documented, uh, Larry played bass and um, George would record his bass parts later and Colin Burgess was on drums. So tracks like Rock and Roll Singer, Soul Stripper, Sunset Strip, which became show business when uh-huh. Bond joined, mm-hmm. uh, Fell in Love were recorded with you on vocals. Do you, do you think those tracks will ever see the light of day? I mean, there is immense interest in this band. Why not release them and give the fans what you oh, want, no, you no, think? That, that's not for me to say. I mean, sure. you know, I, I guess Water's Under the Bridge, they've had the... Uh, the vocals with you know Bon Scott on them and that kind of thing and and leave it at that and, um, mm. and obviously I'd love to hear them myself again because I haven't I haven't got copies of them and uh, I know there's a lot of interest to hear them but uh, I, you know from the point of view of the record label I can see that like that's the release and that's that was the singer at the time and just leave it at that so it's a pity that no one can hear them really but uh, I do rock and roll sing alive. Uh, and I also do Soul Strip Alive, uh, so the fans can actually hear how those mm. two songs sounded with my vocals, so at least I get to hear it live, you know? Agreed. So you co-wrote Sunset Strip and Fell in Love, correct? Yeah. Okay. What, what about your vocals on Rockin' in the Parlour? Were they done in one take from memory? Um, well, not one take. We sort of went through them, and, and every now and again, um, uh, George would say, look, you put a little inflection on this line here, maybe a little inflection there, you know what I mean? And mm. uh, so it didn't take very many takes uh, in those days. Um, and most of us knew what we were doing anyway. I mean, I've been... Sure. But, and the thing is, though, I'd never heard Rockin' in the Parlour before, and I'd never heard Can I Say Next to You, Bill, before. They were brand new songs. I'd never heard them. We'd never played them live. Um, so, really? So, yeah. So really, I just listened while the music was put down, and, and then uh, Malcolm and, and George, I just sang it to me, you know, met this girl mm. for the first time, so, and just sang the melody to me, and I just went, mm, okay, cool, and I just went out there and um, just sang the thing, you know, sang them, and they recorded, recorded them, so, um, well, yeah, that's I, was, interesting. I was just as interested to hear how they sounded after they were recorded, because, you know, I'd never, never sung them before, never heard them before, yeah, cool. Look, um, live rock and roll in Australia back then was a completely different game, wasn't it? I mean, in in 74, ACDC are on the road a lot, two, often three gigs a day, not just in Sydney either. And some of those early shows you were doing, what, three sets lasting four or five hours. How did your voice hold up? Well, not real good, especially when we do the bloody three shows a day, like the lunchtime, early and and late. I mean, it Mm. was a a real killer. And, uh, you know, I mean, your voice just stood handle that I mean, normally we you know we, we would do just a, you know one show what uh, the one show at night but you do three sets anyway you know um, mm. or, or two sets at least and uh i never did just a one set back in those days and um and then when you did like the an early and late that was that was hard enough doing that um mm. and then when they threw when i was in perth and that they uh, they threw it at lunchtime as well that was just that was cruel i mean it, they should yeah. not have done that um, that was just greed, I think, on the part of the manager uh, at the time. And um, uh, uh, my voice gave out there for about two sh- two shows. I just couldn't I couldn't talk, let alone sing. So um, that's what happened. You know, just it was just stupid and ridiculous. And just greed. 
Not many people know this, and I guess you were one of uh, the very few uh, by seeing this firsthand, what a great lead player Malcolm Young was. Because originally, before Angus joined, Mal is playing both lead and rhythm, and then after Angus joined, he and Angus were sharing lead duties. That's right. In fact, a lot of people don't realise that the lead break in uh, Rock of the Parlour is Malcolm playing the lead, not Angus. I didn't know that. So, contrary to popular belief, uh, Dave, the band's first live show was not at Checkers in Sydney, but in fact, the debut show for the still unnamed band was in fact at the last picture show at the old Cronulla Cinema in December 73, which is also where the video for no, Can I not, Sit Next no, to You Girl right. was filmed. No, our first show was at Checkers Nightclub. Really? Uh, yep. And um, that was New Year's Eve, 1973. And uh, later on, we used to play at the last picture show. It was a very popular venue. We used to play there. Sherbet would play there. Hush would play there. Um, it was a, you know, uh, a very good venue down there in Cronulla, and, uh, mm. and we ended up doing our, our, our film clip for our single, Can I Sex You Girl, at that venue. We just, uh, the, the record label hired it when there's no one there, you know, during the day, and we just went in there and, uh, and put the film clip down. But it was one of the, one of the popular uh, venues uh, of, of the day, yeah. But our first, so- first show was at Checkers Nightclub. Uh, okay, so when you're when you're playing in late '73, do, do, are you still are you named ACDC then? Um, yeah, we uh, had to get a name in a hurry because <laughs> huh. uh, it was just sort of plonked on us that uh, we had a show coming up at the famous Checkers Nightclub, the number one nightclub, only a small place, but the number one nightclub in Sydney, uh, mm. New Year's Eve, which was like it's going to be it's, it was always packed anyway, but it's going to be like sardines, and um, we were we, we'd be doing the top spot bringing in the, the new year. Um, so we had to get a name in a hurry and um, um, you know, we tossed around a few names that nobody could agree on and uh, we decided that the next rehearsal we were just going to have three names each, put them in a hat, whoever came out was going to be the uh, the name of the band. Uh, oh. But when we did arrive, uh, Malcolm said that uh, his sister-in-law, Sandra, that's George's wife, had suggested a name, um, uh, ACDC. Um like on the side of all the appliances and uh, means power and that kind of stuff and uh, what do we think of that? And uh, I liked it straight away. I thought it was so easy to remember, ACDC, and it uh, means power and it was free free advertising on all the appliances sure. everywhere. Uh, 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 so I thought definitely. it was great straight away. Colin liked it and, and, and Larry did too. So uh, so Michael said, what will we call ourselves that? We said, yeah, we shook hands and we named ourselves ACDC probably about two weeks, two or three weeks before the Checkers show. Hmm. So uh, I guess this time period, Harry and George are busy recording Stevie Wright's Hard Road album. Are they around much during this period? Um, well, they were busy doing that album uh, as well. I think they finished the, the album uh, before, just before we uh, we done, we started. I said, Mister Uh So that was finished, done, and dusted, and um, it was uh, released, um, of course, before our single was released. So. When our single was released, Can I Sit Next to You, Girl, um, Evie, parts one, two, and three were already number one. Right. Yeah. Maybe you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe that the first gig where the band wear costumes, and I know uh, that Neil Smith um, on bass and Noel Taylor on drums are on board at this stage, was at Victoria Park on City Road down there at Broadway, Camperdown. Um, but with very few photographs of the band during this period, uh, are you pretty much a, a jeans and t-shirt band before that gig? Yeah, we, well, we were. Um, most everybody was back in those days. It was the end of the hippie era, really. The, the late sure. the late seventies, early seventies. Now bands like Lindisfarne and and uh, Fraternity, which um, Bon Scott was in, they're all hippie type bands with sort of long hair and beards and and that sort of stuff, you know, and just just wearing sort of t-shirts and jeans and yeah, you know, that cut up that look, you know, and um, so we were we were virtually the same uh, until our record was about to be released, and uh, then it was suggested that we look more British, the, uh, the contemporary British look, and uh, mm. bands like Slade, um, who were huge all over the world, you know, they were they mm. with tights and boots and stuff, and and Rod Stewart, uh, you know, had striped jackets and scarves and stuff like that, and uh, really. Uh, sort of glamorous looking bands, you know, really um fantastic rock star. Yeah, mm. rock star stuff, you know. So um George wanted us to look British and to look modern, you know. So um it was suggested to us or what was gonna happen was that Angus 
to put his age down three years to 16, you know, because uh, he was mm. still a tiny little guy, and wear a um, schoolboy, homemade schoolboy outfit uh, to, you know, for the kids, for kids so the kids could really relate to us. And uh, Malcolm would wear a, like a silk jumpsuit and boots, some blue boots and stuff like that, and, and for the rest of us to try and uh, look similar, you know, kind of something. Mm. So, uh, Neil Smith, who's uh, RIP, he's dead now, he, I think he died last year, um, yeah. passed away. Uh, he sort of looked like a, you put on, you know, jodhpurs and a crash helmet and try to look like a tough cop. And yeah. um, uh, Noel Taylor wanted to look like a joker to have a pack of cards kind of thing, a top hat and sparkly, uh, not sparkly clothes, but sort of bright clothes, you know. And um, so I sort of put Slade and Rod Stewart together initially, like Slade with the boots and the tights, Rod Stewart with the jacket and scarf. So I sort of put those two together to, and, and that's the, the look. And then the first time we... we Went out on stage was was that show at uh, Victoria Park, and uh, the, we had our fans out there, of course, and they gasped. <laughs> we went, wow, mm. you know, we looked amazing when we walked out. A red and white striped mm. jacket, you could see a mile away, and there was Angus in a schoolboy outfit and all the other outfits, and and then we just we just rocked them hard. And uh, uh, Angus, I don't know, that schoolboy uniform did something to him because he ripped the place up. He was up and down. He'd never done that before. He rocked. We all rocked hard, but we didn't. He didn't really move a lot, you know, uh, from his yeah. spot. And this time he was up and down doing the uh, Chuck Berry uh, duck walk. The duck walk. You know, which, of course, he's famous for for now. Uh, he just ripped it up. So the place went wild. It was it was uh, an amazing experience, and I'll never forget that. <laughs> it, it's a shame, and um, this is a, a different topic altogether, but, I mean, there's so many of those iconic historical places in Australian music history which should be recognised I think other cities do it by way of a plaque or something yeah. uh, particularly down there at Victoria Park but mate uh, let's play a tune I just mentioned the iconic and former Sydney live venue checkers uh, at Goulburn Street which is steeped in Australian rock and roll history it was of course scene of that uh, first gig where um, ACDC 31st December 73 performed I walked past there uh, recently it's like a seedy kind of Chinese massage parlour now which I guess is a nice segue into a track which we're going to play turn this up nice and loud folks because we're going to have a party a rock and roll party from 74 here is acdc with the b-side to the very first single can i sit next to you girl which is of course rocking in the parlor acdc there dave evans colin burgess larry van Crete, and of course angus and malcolm young with the tune rocking in the parlor and some four decades after its release it still sounds pretty darn good to me mate holds up very well but um yeah, I so, Junior, I still do that live. I mean, the well, first time I toured Germany, which is uh, gee, over ten years ago now, mm. uh, I didn't have that in the in the uh, set. You know, I didn't think anybody would even know it, kind of thing. Um, and uh, the crowds were yelling out for it straight up, "Rock in a parlor." <laughs> and, I was, and I said to the band that I was that I was touring with, the all German guys, said, "We better learn this in Ari because the yeah, the crowds want it, and and they do all over the world. I tour all over the world, as you as you probably know." And uh, they want to hear rocking in the parlour. So. so around this time period, June, June 74, there's a lot of momentum for the band who support Stevie Wright um, at the Opera House. You also did background vocals for Stevie that day. In August of 74, the band, um, along with Stevie Wright, do a nationwide tour supporting Lou Reed. Yeah. Uh, what are your memories of those shows? Um, <laughs> they're amazing shows. I mean, Sydney Opera House was something I'll never forget. It's just incredible. They didn't have rock bands in those days, and uh, it was just an, an amazing experience. It was just packed. People outside, there's thousands and thousands of people couldn't get in. Um, a wonderful experience, and of course, you know, Festival Hall uh, was just you know fantastic, and the Horn Pavilion, and uh, you know all the other the great venues we played around Australia. It was just uh, an amazing time, and uh, uh, of course, we had our, our hit record. Uh, Crash and Nifty was racing up the charts all over Australia, top ten. And uh, it was uh, it was hectic. It was really really hectic. A, a time you know I'll never forget. It just it was like a door open and you walk through that door and all of a sudden it all mm. happened. You know, bang. I mean, you're still very young to have uh, have so much. It's such a volume of work, isn't it? The touring must have been uh, incredible. It was really. Um, it was uh, pretty tough, and uh, we didn't have all the comforts or anything like that. And um, when we left Adelaide for Perth. Uh, we only had the, the one truck, really, and um, mm. we were all piled in the back with the with the gear. Um, with, I mean, you wouldn't do this to anybody. We should, no. And uh, with, the, with the back down, it was pitch black inside. 
And uh, we had, and there wasn't tarmac across the Nullarbor in those days. It was just red no. dust. And we had bandanas around our mouth. Uh, the dust was coming up into the back of the, of the truck, and we were stuck in there uh, lying on top of the PA system and all that kind of stuff. And every, you know, few hours we'd stop and rotate. You know, someone would get out and get in the front cabin, and you know, those in the front had to come in the back and, you know, doing the hard yards. And we had a hit record on everything uh, at that time. So, you know, it was uh, it was doing it tough, but uh, you know that's what we that's what we did. Do you know uh, um, a lot has been written about your departure from ACDC, um, with much focus on fashion. Personally, I think you know all that is just um, it's all crap. It, it's a reason, but it's crap. I just think looking back, um, I guess it was just personalities. Yeah, all you I... guys are pretty. All you guys are pretty young then, and if you were more mature, I guess you would have handled things differently. Agreed? Oh, absolutely. I mean. The, the glam thing that's been focused on me is ridiculous. All you have to do is look at the photographs and sure. you'll see the, all the other boys, including uh, Malcolm Young, uh, Angus, all got, got the same gear on. It was the British, the British look and it was, uh, it was the idea of the, you know, the young boys of, uh, of uh, George and, uh, to, to do that. Uh, so you can't point the finger at me. I mean, I thought it was fantastic. It got us a hit record, didn't it? I mean, sure, it, agreed. It worked. It worked. Agreed. We, we looked so different to any other Australian band. And when we were in Adelaide and Perth, but people came to see us and heard our Australian accents. They were surprised. They thought we were they thought we were English. They'd seen the film clip, you know. And mm. uh, so yeah, that glam thing's just bullshit. And uh, it was personalities, and uh, and and especially uh, with the manager, uh, I didn't get on. None of us liked what was happening. We were working our our asses off and not getting paid. And um, uh, of course, the manager got his cut off the top, as it were. And um, so we were all pretty upset about that, and uh, uh, so I confronted him one night in Adelaide, and uh, got to uh, to a physical situation, as we say, and uh, which was I pulled apart pretty quickly. But uh, that mm. was it. I quit the band then because uh, I, I had rent to pay back in Sydney, not getting paid anything, and uh, I was going to lose my flat if I didn't get paid and work my mm. ass off. So that was the that was the situation. And um, uh, once you once you smack the manager or something like that, it's uh, it, that's uh, portent for uh, some of the him or me kind of thing, and uh, I was really upset about that. And um, so we we decided to stick together anyway. The next day after we all sobered up, uh, because we had to go to Perth and uh, uh, with a hit record there and, and back to Adelaide and that kind of thing. So we, the band, I stuck with the band until the end of the tour, hoping that things might resolve, you know, over that period of time. But we still weren't getting paid and stuff like that. So. Um, we were all pissed off, not just me, Malcolm, Angus and the other two boys were also upset about it. Uh, but when we had the meeting in in Melbourne, at the end of it, um, you know, none of us were really talking to each other and it was decided that I split from the band, which mm. I, was, I already split once and so on. Yeah, that's fine. So I'll just ask one more question on ACDC. So, so what are your feelings towards the High Voltage album? Because looking back, that thing is recorded not long after your departure, November 74. And although you are not credited, in my opinion, there's a lot of Dave Evans on that record, if you know what I mean, just the vibe and the... Well, yeah, of course. Um, the, uh, a lot of the songs there, um, like I said, Show Business was a song I've written with the band, Sunset Strip, uh, Bon Scott rewrote the lyrics. Uh, Fell in Love was another one you wrote the lyrics of. I just love song for Gene. We was just about to do Soul Stripper, which was our, one of our top songs, and Rock and Roll Singer, which was written about me. Malcolm wrote that song about me, and you know about my life, leaving home, you know, because of long hair, and, mm. and uh, my father wanted me to be a banker and all that kind of stuff. So he, he knew my life story. So that was personal song for me, uh, hearing Bond singing it, um, mm. and a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, well, that album was you know, should have been. With me, of course, but uh, mm. you know, it wasn't. I was, uh, and I was with Rabbit uh, having a, having a ball at that time, anyway. So um, it's just water under the bridge. Sure, uh, you know, that, that's, leave it at that. So um, you know, at this stage, you're in you're in Rabbit, and as you mentioned, much of that first Rabbit album had been written before you joined. Um, uh, I've got very visual band, uh, of course, but whose idea was it to have drummer Phil Screen do the fire breathing? Um, well. It was funny because we were, you know, I, I got the band to put, to wear all types of boots because I was wearing those in uh, in um, ACDC. And mm. I, I wanted the band to sort of look tough and, and like a gang, you know. Mm. And uh, I really loved the, the movie uh, Clockwork Orange. And uh, and I, I really, I wanted it to sort of look like the Droogs in a way, you know. And, we, and the boys mm. wore braces 
uh, like the Droogs, and uh, Mark Tinson wore a bowler hat, black bowler hat, like the Droogs. And uh, I'd, we'd never heard of Chess at the time. And um, anyway, the drummer, Phil Screen, he, he said, oh, I'm into this new new band, Kiss, you know. And uh, and he showed us an album, and uh, they were in suits at that time, but with the makeup, you know. And, sure. um, and then later on, next minute, they, they had the same outfits as us, virtually. <laughs> um, and they were doing fire breathing. I think Gene Simmons was doing fire breathing. And uh, so we sort of taking notice of this band uh, because of the similarities of their gear now looking like us. And um, anyway, we had a new single coming out called Wildfire. And um, and because of Gene doing the the, uh, the fire breathing, it was it said, oh, it'd be good if one of us uh, did a uh, fire breathing same thing. during the, the song, you know, Wildfire. Mm. And um, mm. see how they stole our outfits. We can steal that from them. <laughs> sure. And... Um, Anyway, I was going to do it, but Phil wanted to do it because he sort of had discovered uh, Kiss for us, kind of, you know, uh, for us. So in the end, I thought, okay, we, we all, we all got, we've all got a, a highlight we do in the show. Um, David Hines, who was one of the guitarists there, he sang a song uh, during the show. Gave me, a, gave me a relief because we were doing two or three sets. So David would sing, and um, Jimmy, the bass player, he'd sing. And uh, and also Mark, Mark Tinson, he'd sing a song as well. So we all got a highlight. And Paul Phil, being the drummer at the back, he didn't get anything, you know? Yeah. Uh, he got up, he, although he was throwing sticks around and, and all that kind of stuff that they did, you know what I mean? Drummers mm. were twirling their, their sticks and he was on a drum stage, so they all saw him. But we thought, okay, okay, I'll get in. I said, and, and, <laughs> and you can do the fire breathing, <laughs> um, uh, which was cool. So Phil then uh, would come out from behind his drum kit at the end of the song, you know, and uh, and and blow the flame, and then go back behind his drum kit and finish the song off. So that's how that that came about. Dave, the band had a, a really mean and confronting image, which was ironic because at the time, teen pop magazines like Screamer were pushing you to that younger age bracket. It's it's funny, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we we were we were a pretty tough outfit. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we, we had, as I said, I wanted the band to sort of emulate a bit like the Droogs. Mm. Uh, of uh, Clockwork Orange. Clockwork Orange. So it had, we had real attitude, no problem about that. A lot of other bands were trying to look nice, you know what I mean? Uh, they had the same kind of outfits as us, or, or they had like the satin and that kind of thing, and there was Sherman, mm. they were the nice boys, you know? And, sure. uh, and you had, I don't know, Taste, I think, from Melbourne, they were nice, you know, that kind of stuff. So they had the niceness, you know? But we were mm. not. We were bad. <laughs> and uh, they actually, the uh, the um, publicist for CBS Records, who we were signed with, come and saw our show and uh, blew her out. She loved it so much, and uh, she wrote wrote about us, you know, for the publicity for the for the record label, and and called me savagely heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> and I I didn't quite know what that meant at the time. I thought, well, what is she? What's she getting at here? And uh, but well, guys, all the other guys in the band said, yeah, yeah, it's good, it's good, it's good. Go with it. So, Do you know what, mate? Those those two albums still hold up, and in my opinion, uh, if Rabbit were based in some place like London, you would have been massive. I, I, I think so. Well, you know, the the band was a great band. There's no doubt about it. No, especially live. The, the only ba- other band that sort of came close to us really was Hush. No, they had a great uh, stage act as well, but they weren't tough. They didn't have that tough edge, you know what I mean? I'm not, mm, I'm not mm. talking them. They were very good. I, I liked uh, Hush Live. They were very exciting. Uh, but we we were the Droogs, all right? <laughs> and um, and everybody loved the stage act. I mean, ask anybody that ever came to see Rabbit. They'll they'll sure. they'll tell you all about it. So yeah, if we'd been in London uh, or overseas or even in America at that time, the band would have been you know huge for sure. There's a lot of there's a lot of uh, Rabbit fans in America, especially in New York. Uh, to this day, so. Dave, I want to play the self-titled track off the second Rabbit album, Too Much Rock and Roll. Would you mind introing that, please, by telling me how that anthemic tune came about? Yeah, that was a song written by Mark Tinson, and um, it's really all about nine to fivers, really, who have to have a day job, and uh, they've just had one wicked weekend of rock and roll. They're ending up not going to work on Mondays, taking sickies on Mondays, and uh, losing the conservative friends and that kind of stuff. Mm. 
too, too, it's a little bit of too much rock and roll, you know, for, for the day job. So uh, it's a pretty cool song. I do it. I still do it. Um, I, I was uh, touring in um, in Ukraine, and they they wanted me to do that particular song. So I did, and uh, the crowd loved it. That was Rabbit there with the title track from their 1976 album, Too Much Rock and Roll. Mate, I think producer Peter Dawkins, who sadly passed away last year, achieved a really loud and great sound on that record. Um, you know, he produced tons of people at the time, you know, uh, right, has yeah. gone on. Yeah, Sorpy. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people. Um, um, Russell Morris, he did Russell Supply, Morris. Don't forget Air Supply, they're number one in America, you know. Yeah, that's right. he did Love and Other Bruises, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, he sadly passed away last year. That's right. We've got to get uh, Mark Tinson, I think, on the show sometime soon because I think the guy's an incredible guitar player. Um, he's also had a great career, and I think he's... Uh, I know he's still out there producing top-class music, and I know that Mark produced and played on your Sinner album with other guys from your past, like David Hines and Simon Croft. Not many artists get a chance to reopen a door to their past, as you did then, and create new and vital rock and roll, do they? Yeah, that's right. Um Mark's uh, an incredible talent all around, and uh, he uh, produces. He's been producing country music as well, believe it or not, mm. and winning mm. awards with that. So he can do anything. He's a great songwriter, guitarist, bass player. He played bass on a few tracks too. He played great bass, man. He was good, mm. and uh, he sings as well. He, he's just an all-round talent, and uh, he and I just get on so well with, with the songwriting. We 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 click. Just like that, and after all those years, after I went to do the Sinner album with him, it was just brilliant to work with him. And then, of course, I did the Judgment Day album with him as well. Wrote the songs with with Mark, and uh, it was just so we were just so close. We just we knew exactly what we wanted uh, with everything, you know. Uh, even though our personalities are completely different, mm. uh, uh, really different personalities, but when it comes to the music, we're we're we're, we're as one, you know. It's amazing. So in the late seventies and early eighties, where was Dave Evans? You had an outfit called uh, the Hot Cockerels. Did they ever demo material? Yeah, I had Dave, Dave Evans, and Hot Cockerel, and uh, we were doing really well in Melbourne. Um, you know, two guitars, bass, drums, packing them out uh, with original material. And Simon Croft mm. in that band with me. I wrote uh, quite a few songs with Simon, uh, mm -hmm. great guitarist. And um, but when I tried to get a record label interested back in those days in the early eighties. Um, mm. They all loved the tunes, um, but they couldn't offer me a contract because uh, new music had come in with, with synthesizer music. If you remember, the 80s was all synth synthesizer uh, type of stuff, and they said, look, you know, uh, we could uh, we could uh, record uh, the album, but we'd never get it on radio because radio is playing all that, that, new, that new kind of softer uh, kind of music, you know. Um, I'm, I'm trying to forget all that uh, horrible yeah, period. Yeah, it's <laughs> the computer games and... You know, yeah. all that computer music was, was was in back in those days, and um, they said go to America. You know, you'll kill it over there. And I said, well, who's going to pay for our airfares to go? You know, sure, um, sure. So we were stuck. But then um, I had a good mate um, who had a, a, a small record label, Reaction Records, and uh, he loved my music. He was a great fan, and he said, look, Dave, if you will add piano and strings and maybe you know, a little bit of synth on top of the two guitar bass drum sound then I'll be able to uh, I'll, I'll give you a contract so I thought that was going to be really interesting and it sounded great so that's that's what I did I went into the studio and I just uh, really put the songs down basically and I would have done it anyway to you know, uh, two guitars bass drums the, the solid rock foundation and then on top of that we put French horns and bloody, you know it. And uh, mm. it, it, Dave Evans and Thunder Down Under. It was a uh, brilliant album. Uh, some of my fans love that. It was one of my best albums. And we got you Mark Durnley out, Mark Durnley out from London to produce it. Uh, Mark Durnley had worked with that many great people, ACDC for one. Uh, sure. Uh, members of Kiss. I mean, he'd already had a number one hit in in, uh, in England uh, with a guy, a solo host over there. So we got the best. And we got the best musicians in Australia too. Uh, we had Johnny Farnham's backing singers, and you know, uh, John Dalimore on guitar as well, and, and some uh, Joe Crichton from the Black Sorrows, uh, Joe Camilleri. Uh, he played sax on a couple of tracks, and uh, it was a great, uh, great record. We loved it. But uh, sadly, the uh, record label, Reaction Records, 
uh, being a small little wet bust, and that was the uh, they couldn't really really promote it. So well, I, I um. I- a lot of us bought it. I bought the Thunderdown album when it was released, and mate, uh, that's the heaviest and raunchiest version of Waltzing Matilda, which you'll ever hear. But, but, but the back, the back cover. The thing is, though, the my mate also said to me, "We'll layer it with other stuff on top of the, the two guitar plays." And I was like, "You must do me a favour." And I said, "What?" Mm. He said, "You've got to do a heavy version of Waltzing Matilda." Now, promise me it that you'll works. do that. He said to me, "Right," and you've got you, you've got your contract. So, yeah. uh, I. I said, okay, I'll do it, and uh, that's the uh, the version of Walsy Matilda, and I know a lot of people love that version very yeah, much. Love it, and on that back cover, you have the striped jacket and scarf on. You you could nearly trademark that look, mate. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a black and black and red one, red. Uh, rather than that's right. red and white one sort of thing. Um, I haven't worn a stri- striped jacket since then. Um, I kind of <laughs> like them. Uh, you never know; I might go and get, get another one now. <laughs> Dave, we are running short of time, but I do want to look uh, just quickly at some of your recent solo material and indeed crank a couple of tunes. I absolutely love your third solo album, Judgment Day, from 2008. I I just love it. Classic hard rock of the best kind. And listeners may not know that horror author Gary Charles put out a book in 2011 titled Tranquil Disturbances, which not only includes some of your lyrics in the book, Dave, but has a sinister-looking photograph of you on the cover. Uh, How did did that come about? Uh, Well, Gary... um actually um, did a, an amazing review of Sinner uh, in the UK. I mean, he just blew them out. And uh, the, the review was just <laughs> incredible. I just loved it. And uh, he loved my music. became an instant fan. And um, and then, you know, I, I had Judgment Day coming out and stuff like that. And he just got in, we kept in touch, you know. And mm. he had a radio program. I went on his radio program and that kind of thing. And uh, anyway, he had a new book. Uh, omnibus coming out, Tranquil Disturbances, and he asked me if he could use me on the front cover, you know, looking very sinister, uh, mm. holding a double barrel shotgun or something, and <laughs> yeah. uh, I said, yeah, sure, and he also said, look, I want to incorporate some of the lyrics, I think of Judgment Day, I think it was, uh, of the song Judgment yeah. Day, uh, in, w- in one of his books, one of the three books of the Omnibus, and uh, I was just thrilled about that, I got in touch with Mark Tinson, I said, no problems, Mark said, no, no problems. Like we'd written a song together, I had to get his permission too. And uh, so Gary uh, brought out the book. He sent me the book too. I've read it, full of blood, guts, and gore. You can, <laughs> I mean, I can't think I've read more blood, guts, and gore in my whole life. And uh, the good thing is, I, I toured the UK. Uh, last time I toured the UK two years ago. Uh, oh, was it last year? I can't remember. I'm all over the world at the moment. Sorry. Uh, I, Gary came to one of my shows, and I met him for the first time. And it was really cool to have Gary be in the audience while I did Judgment Day. Mate, I want to play the album opener from Judgment Day, We Don't Dance to Your Song. Many fans, including myself, think that this is one of the best tunes you've produced. Um, We don't march to your drum, we don't run from your guns, we don't jump and we won't be pushed. Here is Dave Evans. Before you go, I want to mention you've been on the road with Molly Hatchett. They're a pretty good match. Uh, Molly Hatchett, well, yeah, they're a different type of rock, they're southern. Mm. Uh, American rock, and um, I didn't really know too much about them. I know Little Skinner's been around for a long, long time, and, uh, sure. uh, but I never really got into them, not not for any particular reason, you know. And um, the man, my manager at the time, uh, was a German guy who was uh, managing Molly Hatchet as well, and uh, organised a tour of Germany and Switzerland and Holland uh, with the two of us, you know. And um, mm. Mm. You know, yeah, it was, that was great, and. Um, I got the Dave Evans band at that time. Got two Aussie guys uh, and two English guys uh, in the band, and we toured together. It was a fantastic tour. I mean, uh, it's probably one of the best shows around for a long, long time. They got two major acts. The, the Germans were just, you know, it was like the old days when we, when when we used to have the you know, four or five bands come out from overseas. You get four different kind of acts. Sure. You know, you get three sure. with Status Quo, with Linda's Fan or whatever. You get four. And you've got your money's worth. And uh, these days you'll get two heavy metal bands on together. What's the yeah. point? You get two yeah. hard rock bands. It's like, no you know, variety. Whatever. Yeah. But this was brilliant. And uh, we supported Molly Hatchett because they'd been in, in Europe for many, 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 many years and they had that many fans and that many albums out. That didn't mind. We just went on there and smashed them. And uh, even though Molly Hatchett boys and my boys, we became very close friends and very good friends. And also, mm. uh, you know, we loved each other's music, but 
we we blew them off the stage every night, and um, uh, it's hard to go on after after our act. You know, it was just that hard, the hard hard mm. rock, mm. hard badass rock, just smashed the Germans and uh, everyone. Good to hear. And uh, yeah, and but the thing is, all the boys from Molly had to be side stage every night, cheering us on. And uh, good to hear. Yeah, in fact, the lead singer got a Dave Evans T-shirt. He said, "This will be my privilege." Uh, for you, and he wore the Dave Evans T-shirt every night when he performed from then on, and that Good. was just that's Phil, the singer. What a gentleman! What an incredible gesture! And he just raved about me through his act. He'd say, "What about Dave Evans?" He'd say, "You know, uh, those those American boys were just so fantastic to me." And um, the write-ups we got were brilliant from all the magazines everywhere. What a show. And afterwards, I'd meet the fans at the merchandising, and they were just saying, you know, we've got two great bands tonight, two great bands. And so mm. that tour was a very special tour. And, uh, you know, the boys from Molly Hatchet uh, were just so good to me and, and my boys and the Dave Evans band. A great, great show together, for sure. Great to hear, but uh, you, you, Dave, I think good rock and roll always finds its audience, and um, n- never, never truer with that story there about Molly Hatchet. But the what about tomorrow EP released in 2014? I'm going to close out today's show with that tune. Very cutting and to the point lyrics about the messy state of the world we're living in today. They're all your lyrics, and I, I know that uh, one thing I've always loved about your music is um, the discovery. And the guy who produced that EP, uh, David. Mobley, Mobley, I think, an incredible player. And he he himself has had a long and stellar career in the US and Texas. Um, Just love that EP, and I recommend anyone uh, who loves Dave Evans, straight down the line, hard hard rock and roll. Well, well, actually, actually David wrote those songs. I didn't write them. No, he was the the, uh, uh, executive producer of the uh, Revenge album that I did with John Nitzinger uh, that was released last year. Uh, John Nitzinger is an ex-Alex Cooper guitarist and Texas rock blues legend. What? And uh, I did an album with Johnny, which got five out of five stars around the world and won 10 out of 10, believe it or not. It's an unbelievable album, Revenge, if you haven't got it. Uh, but David was the executive producer of that, the, the money man. And uh, when he heard what I did with Johnny, he said, when you get a chance, can you?" he's, he's been around a long time, he said, David's been a songwriter, a producer, and, and guitarist for many, many years. Uh, mm. He said, "Look, can you do can you do some of my songs? You know." Um, so I had a chance to do that and recorded, and, and and I had a pick of all of his songs. He had that many. He said, "What are the ones you want to do?" And I, what about tomorrow? I heard that song. I went, "That is right now. That message has to get out now." It's very strong. Very strong. It has to get very out. Strong. It's bloody serious. The world's in a serious state. So I agreed. So I picked that one and on all the other ones as well. There's five completely different songs to each other. But David and any and his songwriting uh, partners are very diverse as songwriters. Um, so I picked five completely different songs, and uh, that one though had, it had to be that one. What about tomorrow? Mm. And we called the uh, the five track EP "What About Tomorrow." And David uh, produced them as well and played some brilliant guitar. Yeah, I'm very proud of that uh, EP for sure. You should be. You should be. It's a great. It's a great uh, EP and a great uh, great track. But mate, what are your plans for the rest of 2015? Well, I'm back in Australia the last couple of days, uh, just chilling out. I've got one or two shows to do. Um, hopefully heading back to the States uh, for some shows uh, up in the northeast, uh, around Ohio and around that area. Um, but then I've got to go, uh, then I'm booked to go back to Ukraine. Um, I toured there twice last year. So they want me back again, of course, because I was the only one that would go. Uh, they... The other acts all uh, cancelled, of course, last year due to mm. troubles over there. Aerosmith cancelled and Depeche Mode and Peter Gabriel, they all, they all cancelled. But I rang two days before I was supposed to go and just asked them if the Kiev airport was still open. They said it is. <laughs> so I said, I'm coming, mate. So I went and toured there. And um, so they want me back. Uh, so I'll be back there and uh, possibly some more U.S. shows at the uh, Good. second half of next year. So. Mate, you get asked this a lot, but as I mentioned before, interest in ACDC these days is huge. Yeah. Are there any any plans for a book? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of uh, making a couple of sort of uh, uh, inquiries at the moment regarding that. So uh, that's the next thing on my agenda is to write the... It's funny, probably the, the uh, 
one of the last books written about ACDC, but it's about the first part of ACDC because without that first uh, 12 months of the birth of the mm. band, etc., um, the rest of the uh, history is not, not complete, can't be. And uh, the fans want to know exactly what happened in that first 12 months. And uh, so I am making some inquiries now to write the book so that, so that the ACDC fans out there worldwide uh, can have the full collection, you know, otherwise they haven't got it. Agreed. It's not complete. You, you know, your 12 months or a bit over 12 months is, is very, very vital to that band. Yeah, but, and, uh, and with Colin Burgess and, and the other boys, sure. Larry Van Capriet and uh, you know, other people, uh, as you mentioned them before, uh, their story's got to be told too. It's not just all about Dave Evans. Uh, of course, sure. I'm, I'm the one that can write it, of course, but these people were all part of ACDC and um, Agreed. they shouldn't be discounted without every member. Uh, it couldn't be the band uh, that there is today. So. I know that you're friends with uh, Mal's son, Ross. Do you know how Malcolm's doing these days? Well, uh, it's the same that's in the papers and stuff, and Ross doesn't really say too much about it. Um, Fair enough. It's just that, uh, you know, he, he has been uh, in a facility um, uh, for for a while now, and, uh, and that he, you know, I think it's common knowledge it has been reported everywhere. I think Brian Johnson's also reported that uh, he won't be back with the band and he's he's uh, completely completely retired now because of, of dementia. So. Mm. Mate, uh, if people wish to contact you and buy your material, they should head to your official site at daveevansrocks.com. Uh, Dave, we better wrap this thing up. It has been really great chatting with you today. We've gone an hour and I really appreciate it. Personally, and this is just my own opinion, but your contribution to the legacy of ACDC in those earliest days was vital. And I think that because you were the original singer, you have often been unjustly scrutinized, but your record and your musical offerings are out there for all to see. May I also say that your time in ACDC is only a small part of a great career, which continues to this day. You've produced a great body of work, one which many of us still enjoy listening to. So thank you, mate. Now, look, I really appreciate that, Dennis. And, uh, um, I hope uh, my fans uh, will listen to the uh, to the radio program, and uh, uh, no, one one day I hope we uh, we catch up with each other. So thanks. Look forward to it. Before you go, every guest on our show gets to request a song by an Australian band, can be one of yours yep. or something special easy. to you. So Friday on let's my close mind. out. Friday on my mind. Easy beat, so. Fantastic. Let's close out with that. Thank you for your time today, Dave. Yeah, thanks very much, Dennis. Cheers.